Severance Afterlife A short story by Tom Kahn It was a cold, rainy afternoon and Trevor had just got paid. After counting up his goings out and his pay, he subtracted with his fingers and thumbs and worked out exactly how much he had left. And with the extra hours he had done, Fibber had some extra money this week, so he decided that he'd call into the department store on the way home and buy a new coat. On the way home, he popped in to the Easy Breeze Superstore and tried to avoid the small army of shop assistants who immediately came rushing over to him to welcome him to the store. All to no avail, however. Fibber was cornered by six over-friendly underpaid shop assistants in the men's wear section. He gave in and allowed one of them to bring some coats for his approval. In the end, Fibber was glad of the help because the staff managed to find him a coat that was reduced to half price of the original cost, which was £40. So after paying for the coat, he thought to himself, Yes, I've got enough for a pint at the geese. And they could all save the new coat. He made a fast exit out of the Easy Breeze store and was soon heading towards McGee's front door. He walked into McGee's and made his way into the bar like a fashion model on a catwalk where he ordered a pint and then he went to the center table where he could be seen by everyone in the bar. He placed his glass on the table and slowly took off his new coat, hanging it on the back of the chair. Then he gave the barman a shout. Hey, Topper, keep your eye on my pint, will you? And the new coat. I have to use the toilet. Topper gave a lazy wave and Trevor went to the toilet. A few moments later, Trevor returned to discover his drink had been drunk and the coat was gone. Hey, Topper, what's going on? I told you it wasn't my pint in the coat. Ah, sir. Your woman came in and she took her home for you. You know, your woman. What woman? What woman? Said Fibber. Topper replied, Your wife. Your wife. I have no wife. She divorced me years ago. Topper looked up at the ceiling. Well, how would I have known that, Fibber? Sorry about that. You're sorry. What do you think I feel? You know what? I get forced out half a week's wages on that coat. Herbert put his head down and walked out of McGee's. And on the way home, he went to the gas company to see how much the gas bill was. The salesman greeted Fibber. What's wrong, Fibber? You and you got upset. Is everything okay? Fibber replied, Some dirty... Good for nothing thief of a woman has just stole my new leather coat. I just bought it no more than half an hour ago. It cost me 20 pounds. How am I ever going to keep warm and dry now? The postal worker responded. Uh, Fibber, you believe in God? Of course I believe in God, but what's I got to do with it? How's I ever going to get my coat back? The postal worker looked into Fibber's eyes and he said, I want you to go home and to write God a letter. Tell him exactly what has happened and how much you spent on the coat. And if you believe in God, you'll get your money back. Sarah so thought for a moment and he said, Well, I suppose I've got nothing to lose. Okay, I'll do what you say. So that night before going to bed, Sarah started to write a letter. Dear God, it's me, Sarah. And I'm just after losing my new leather coat that cost me 20 pounds. Some sleazy, sneaky woman had just walked into my keys as I was relieving myself in the toilet and she grabbed my new coat from the chair. Or can I ever keep warm in these cold nights ahead? And can you please get money back that I spent as soon as possible? Thank you, God. You're sincerely, or I should say, faithfully, for her focus McFadden. He put the letter into an envelope and wrote in capital letters G-O-D and underlined it on the envelope and then he walked to the post office and dropped the letter 
and to the box. And that night as the mail sorters were going through the postal articles, one of them came across this letter addressed to God. And seeing as he was from the well-to-do part of the city, he decided that he would open it. As he read the contents, he shouted out to all of his work colleagues, uh, Listen to this, everybody, listen! Fibber McFadden had his new 20 pound coat stolen this afternoon in McGee. Oh, that's a terrible thing to have happened. Why don't we all put something in and see how much we can collect and maybe on the way home uh, from work I can drop it into his home. I know where Fibber lives and I'm sure that will cheer him up. What do you say? Everyone agreed and 18 pounds was raised between all the postal workers. And as promised on the way home, the post office worker slipped the letter with the 18 pounds underneath Fibber's door. When morning came, Fibber got out of bed, and on his way to the kitchen, he saw a ladder lying there at the front door and rushed over to open it up. He could hardly believe his eyes when he counted out 18 pounds, and he shouted aloud, Thank you, God, for getting me my money back. That morning, Fever couldn't wait to rush off to the gas company to tell the salesman there what had happened. <laughs> As he walked through the front door of the gas company, the salesman greeted Fibber. Good morning, Mr. McFadden. Did you do what I told you? Fibber smiled and he replied, I did, and sure enough, this morning I got 18 pounds back. The salesman looked a little concerned and he said to Fibber, uh, But didn't you say it was 20 pounds that you... Um, paying for the coat, Fibber? Oh, uh, yes, I did, but you know what those thieving bastards in the post office are like. He gave the salesman and the gas company a wave and made his way back to the Easy Breeze department store, where to his surprise the same coat had been reduced again to ten pounds. Now, with his new coat again, and still enough for a few pounds, Fever walked back to McGee's. He went through parading the new coat as he walked to the bar, where he ordered a pint. He could feel the eyes on him as he stood at the bar where he waited for his pint to be poured. He waited for the barman to fill the glass, and after taking a seat and sipping on his beer, he took a coaster from the table and he wrote down a message. This coat belongs to me. Don't touch it. Signed, Jumpy and Boxer, Fist McFudden. Then, he told the barman to keep an eye on his coat and drink while he went to the toilet. When Fever returned from the gents, he saw that the coat was gone and the glass was empty. And on the other side of the drink coaster, somebody had written a message. Thanks for the coat. Signed, Champion Runner, Fleisch Flanagan. Fever screamed out to the barman, Hey, Topper! Where's my coat and drink gone? I told you to keep an eye on them. The barman replied, I was, sir, but, but this woman came and she took your coat. She said she was a mother-in-law when that she knew, you knew she was coming uh, to take the coat. And she had to do some alterations to it. And that you could take the coat up on your way home from the house. 
She says, I've got even to her. Open the door now. A second ago. I search your game. Screamed Figger. Figger right out the door. And as soon as his foot hit the pavement, he had a scout around. And then he seen them. He could hardly believe his eyes. There they were. The two of them, just across the road, waving to him. It was his ex-wife, Fiona, and his ex-mother-in-law, Sarfaith Flanagan. Fibber couldn't control his anger, and as he seen them both wearing his leather coats and a fit of rage without looking, he ran straight onto the road and straight in front of a number 89 double-decker bus that collected and killed him instantly. When Dacker had opened his eyes, poor, poor man, Fibber was lying there. And beside him was sitting his ex-wife and his ex-mother-in-law. But where were they? Strange kids. Two of them, the two of them were in a leather coats. He looked angry at them. He could hardly speak. And they said, <laughs> uh, yeah, You were just a joke, remember? <laughs> we never meant any harm. When we saw you were uh, hit by the bus, we came running to say if you were okay. Both of us ran straight across. From a truck that killed us both. <laughs> Here we all are. The three of us. <laughs> Trevor was just about to give them a piece of his mind. An old Nick himself approached them through the gates of hell with his pitchfork in his hand and a hairy submission book in the other. He looked at all three of them and checked the book. Then he asked them all for their names. They all spoke at once. I, I'm Fibber. Uh, I'm Fiona. And I'm his ex, Mrs. Flanagan. His ex-mother-in-law. Nick checked the list a couple of times. And he said, I'd like to welcome you all to the pits of hell where you're going to spend a lot of time weeping and gnashing your teeth. Mrs. Flanagan replied, Oh, but I don't have any teeth. Old Nick replied, Teeth will be provided. Fiona began weeping and wailing. Oh, Mr. D! <laughs> Mr. D! Oh, you would like... Mr. D would like me when I start weeping and gnashing my teeth. Oh, please! I'll put your head away. You're so straight. I'm ready to tell you. Oh, Lord, why are you life? I made his life hell. Oh, if you excuse me, pun. <laughs> Trevor then said, Never a truer word has he ever spoke, Nick. The thing is, Mr. Beelzebub, there must be some mistake. Could you check your books again? I've never done anybody any harm, and maybe somebody has put my name by mistake on your books. You know, I'm not the only fibber. There's lots of fibbers in the world. Uh, could you just check one more time? My name... Is uh, Fibber, alias Frankie Jr., alias Fibber, Fosco Jr. Old Nick looked at the three of them. And he stuck his pitchfork into the ground and he opened up the book again. He ran his finger up and down some of the pages. And after a few moments he said, I don't know how this has happened. But going by the information in this book... There seems to be a small discrepancy between the temptations I sent and the amount of sins you actually committed. You have all been given the right to one interview at the gates up there instead. So, there is a slight chance that you might not have to stay with me forever. Which I'm not very happy about. However, if Peter, who has the keys to the other place, decides to send you back to me, 
Man, I really gonna turn up the heat. Mrs. Flanagan shouted. So tell me where I'm free to go. Nick took his pitchfork and pointed it to a doorway, saying, Go through that door and take the lift to the second floor. But remember, I'll be here waiting for you to return. Then Nick disappeared in a puff of smoke. The three of them made their way to the lift, and with the push of a button, the door of the lift opened and they were all standing within seconds outside the pearly gates. St. Peter stood there holding an admission book to heaven and said, What is your name and what do you want? Fibber spoke first. Uh, well, see, my name is Fibber, and uh, I, I want to come into the kingdom where I can live peacefully forevermore. St. Peter replied, That's a great answer, Fibber, but there's a few things you need to do before this can happen. First, go through that narrow door over there, the door with man's only on it, and then wait for me there. Right. Okay, okay, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be waiting for you there. St. Peter, I'll do that, I'll do that. And off went Fibber. St. Peter looked at the other two women standing there, and he opened up the book and he said, Nice leather coats. Uh, tell me, where on earth did you get those? Fiona spoke first. Well, they actually were gifts for my uh, husband, my husband, St. Peter. Uh, they were gifts. Mrs. Flanagan also seconded that. Oh, that's right, St. Peter, they were a gift. St. Peter replied, hmm, In the record of events here, it says that both of you took the coats without permission. Is that true? Oh, well, <laughs> it is an addition, St. Peter. Uh, see, himself and I were married for many years. Uh, and all that time, you promised to buy me a new coat, and you never did. You also promised my dear mother for your exactly the same. So we're just taken back. I see what he promised. Mrs. Flanagan nodded in agreement. Uh, people who shouldn't make promises that they can't keep compared, you know. So we're actually doing him a favor. We, we, we never wanted him to take that debt into the afterlife. A broken promise would be a terrible thing to take. Um... St. Peter smiled at both of them and he said, Oh, well, come with me. He took the keys from his pocket and he opened up the pearly gates. The two women made their way through the gates and stood there upon a very long road that seemed to stretch for an eternity. Mrs. Flanagan looked up at St. Peter and said, Is that heaven? And are we the only ones here? St. Peter pointed to a road that stretched forever and he said, it's a long walk to the kingdom. <laughs> Watch the ducks. Then, as he left them, they both started walking along the road, and Fiona said, What do you mean about the watching for ducks? Suddenly, a little duck ran straight in front of them, and Mrs. Flanagan stepped on it and killed it. That very instant, St. Peter appeared, and he said, I told you to watch the ducks. Now, ah, look what you've done. <gasps> That's a dead duck for sure. Mrs. Flanagan replied, Oh, I'm really sorry about that. That was an accident. I promise that will never happen again. Oh, please, <laughs> just look over and ask me a kid, St. Peter. St. Peter gave a loud whistle, and along came this horrible-looking monster of a man with a non-shaven face and reeking of smelly odor. He had boils on his boils on his skin, and a face with water dribbling from his mouth and his nose. St. Peter produced a set of handcuffs, he put one on Mrs. Flanagan and the other one on the hideous man-creature and said, I told you to watch the ducks. So, for not doing as I asked you to, I am going to chain you to him for an eternity. So now, off you go. But, but, but. Off you go. So off along the road went Mrs. Flanagan and the awfully unattractive partner to, to spend an eternity chained together. After that, Fiona was so frightened of stepping on a duck that she carefully took each step slowly and surely along the road, making sure to keep an eye out for the ducks. Meanwhile, back in the men's only section at the pearly gates, Fibber was standing among a multitude of men waiting for their instructions. St. Peter stood in front of the men and he said, Okay, I'm going to ask all of you men that were hand-packed or nagged by their wives or girlfriends to stand all over there to the far left. Every single man, bar one, moved to the left. St. Peter was intrigued 
and pointed to the lonely figure standing there and said, Hey, what are you doing there, standing all in your room? The man nervously replied, Well, you see, the wife told me to. St. Peter answered, I see, I see, okay, oh well. Now you can to stand in line with all the other men, so move over there to the left. After he had done that, St. Peter addressed all the men, saying, One by one, all of you must go into the room. I will show you, and inside the room you'll find a blackboard, some chalk, and what I need you all to do is write down your sense on the blackboard, so I can go and double-check them from the list that I have. Then, carefully, after considering what can be forgiven and what cannot be forgiven, some will be erased and some will not be. Then the next process after that will be the short listed selection of the chosen few who will be permitted to walk the road to the kingdom of heaven. All those selected will have a stamp on their foreheads to separate them from the rest who may try to sneak through the pearly gates to paradise. So, the first man went into the room to write down all of his sins. It took him a long while, however. Eventually he returned. Well, have you finished writing down your sins? The man replied. Oh no, I need another piece of chalk. So St. Peter produced more chalk and the man returned back into the room. After another long while, the man returned and he said, I've finished now. St. Peter called the next man forward, who happened to be Fibber. St. Peter looked at him and said, Okay, your turn now. Go on. Write your sins. Like the previous man did. And come back. Fibber went into the room and he took even longer than the first man. And when he finally came out of the room, St. Peter said, Oh no, so don't tell me you need another piece of chalk then. Fibber replied, no, I need another blackboard. So St. Peter took Fibber to another room and he said, Okay, go in there. You'll find another blackboard and some more chalk. Just continue to write down your sins and when you've finished, come and let me know. It took a long time. But at last, Fibber finished writing down all the sins. St. Peter looked at him and told him that he was unconditionally approved for a forehead stump so he could nigh return to the parlor gates and wait. Meanwhile, back on the road to heaven, Fiona was still very carefully walking along the road to the kingdom, looking for ducks before she took each step, and suddenly St. Peter appeared before her, and he whistled out, Along the road came this beautiful six-foot-tall, blue-eyed, well-toned, muscular man with a brown tan skin and smelling a sweet perfume. St. Peter looked at Fiona and he said, Oh, well, well done, Fiona. You've been very careful. And you've watched for ducks. So, as a reward, he took out a pair of golden handcuffs and he put one on Fiona and the other on this Adonis-looking creature and he said, You're going to be chained forever to this handsome man for an eternity. Now, off you both go on the road. With that, St. Peter disappeared. Fiona stood there on the road looking up at this beautiful man and she goose pimply and googly eyed and said to him, So what did you do? He looked down at her and he said, I stopped on the dock. Then, off they both went along the road to heaven. After a long while walking along the road, Fiona and Mrs. Flanagan were not making much progress. Shackled by the wrist to the partners, every step was a struggle, and complaining never ceased. St. Peter had been watching from afar and could see how unfair it was to chain the unhappy couples for an eternity, and he had to change a heart, and decided that it might be best to take the handcuffs off and set free those who were not much together, much to relief of those hard done by who would have been happy in heaven in another relationship instead of being bound by the wrong kind of ties. And back at the pearly gates, Fibber was approved and was given a forehead stamp and was soon on the road to heaven. Along the way there, Fibber met an angel who said he could answer any questions he might have. So Fibber asked the angels, What's the difference between now, uh, you know, heaven and the other place? So the angel took him to two rooms. One had a sign, Heaven's Dining Room, and the other had a sign, Hell's Dining Room. And inside both rooms, there were two things. 
people sitting at a table with lots of food in front of them. In the room marked heaven, everyone sat smiling and talking together in various plates with all kinds of food. There was no cutlery on the table. But each one fed each other and shared some humor. Whereas in the other room, they weren't feeding each other. They were sitting arguing. So the angel looked at Ferber and he said, So as you can see, the difference is that heaven, everyone helps each other. And they get along well, but in hell, no one is happy. And they cannot help each other. Does that answer your question? Ferber said, it does. Have you any questions? The angel asked. Ferber replied, well, I have, a, I have my own house. Will I have a, my own house when I get to heaven? Oh, I, I hope so. The house that you will have will depend on the good things you did on earth and how much help you have given to others. The angel left Ferber and at this point he reached the pearly gates and beyond into the kingdom of heaven. And Fibber could not believe his eyes when he got to his allocated block of land where all there was was timber lying on the ground. Where's my house? Where is my house? I can't, I can't stay here forever <laughs> without a house. Please. An angel appeared. Well, you see, all that timber belongs to you. That's all that arrived because you never helped anyone before in your life. So now it's up to you to build your own house. Oh, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Please, just give me one chance. Just give me some help. Well, you can't ask for an approval. So he walked down the road and he could hardly believe eyes when he seen his mother-in-law in a beautiful two-story house and his ex-wife in this other comfortable home with trees and flowers. I'll be a better man, please. I'll be a better man if you could just, just help me. Help me to get a, a decent house. So with that, I just need somebody to help. I've got no house in heaven. Just timber lying on the ground. An angel appeared. As I told you, all of that timber belongs to you. That's all that arrived. No builders came. We never helped anyone. And now here, nobody wants to help you. It's up to you. Build your own house. Your ex-wife, your ex-mother-in-law, they can't help you. But I don't know anything about building, said Fibber. The angel said, Well, you've got plenty of time to learn. Fibber looked at the angel. Oh, so... Uh... If I had been more helpful to others on earth, my house would have been built for me. The angel said, Yeah, that's right. Trevor looked a little sad. I really don't want to spend an eternity living out in the open. Would it be possible for me to go back and try again? I promise I'll do more to help people. I'll be kind and generous. To everyone I meet, I'll help old ladies across the street. I'll be a better man. I'll, I'll do voluntary work. I'll, I'll fix up the broken windows in the church. I can assure you, I'll do everything I can. The angel looked at Fibber and smiled. <laughs> You're a very lucky man because I've been told by God Himself that there is one option available to you to change your circumstances here in heaven. And if you succeed here, then things will look much better for you. Trevor replied, Oh, tell me, Angel, what is that option? I'll do whatever it takes. The angel spoke. You have to go and save someone from making the wrong choice and 
By doing that he will have a different life. And the promise of heaven, when his life is over, will be his. Sever said, Okay, I, I'll do it. So, tell me, uh, who is he, um, this person? Uh, and what am I going to do? And, uh, and how will I know him? And, uh, just give me some instructions about the job I have to do. The angel answered, All your questions will be answered. Just trust. You see. Now, go. And God be with you. Trevor was taken by an angel to a door. Get in the door and the lift went down. Instead, when the door opened, Trevor was standing in McGee's bar where he sat with some of his friends drinking for a while. Fibber felt right at home again, with one hand in his pocket. He could hear money jingling. Another drink for you, Fibber, said Jack, an old friend who usually paid for the drinks. Fibber stood up and he said, Oh, no, 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 I'm buying this ride. Jack, you sit there. There was a silence descended on the bar as Fibber walked over to the pay for the drink order. For Fibber always drunk alone, if he could to avoid buying other people drinks. What's getting to Fibber? He's gone to the bar. You can hear the whispers around. Something's not right. Not like Fibber. Maybe he's not well. Suddenly a man pushed open the door of the bar. He approached the bar. He produced a handgun and pointed it to the barman's head and said, "Uh, Give me all the money and the tell. All all that's a dad's takings. Fibber looked at the gunman sympathetically, and he said, Please, don't, please, don't do that. Give me the gun and, and walk away. The gunman spun around, and he looked at Fibber with a cold stare. Who the hell do you think you're talking to? Fibber replied, I'm talking to you. And you better listen to what I'm going to about to tell you. For it might just possibly save you from burning in the pits of hell for an eternity. The gunman was struck dumb, and Fibber continued to speak. Do you remember when you were young and innocent, before the day when your whole world changed, before you went bad? No, that was not your fault. You mustn't blame yourself for what happened between you and your father. That was the way it had to be. Your father was a good man. And he died. Young, because God loved him so much. He loved him so much that he wanted to bring him home to be with him. The gunman dropped his gun to the floor. And he said, how do you know this? How do you know this? I thought it was my fault my father died because he left. He got up and he walked out to the house. And he fell asleep in the cold. As the gunman walked out of the pub, he left his gun on the floor. A stunned audience of people stood up and applauded Fibber for what had just happened. Fibber could hear in the distance the sound of saws cutting timber and nails being hammered. And a man walked into the bar and he said, Taxi out the front for Fibber Fosco McFadden. Fibber walked out the bar with the angel and was never seen again in McGee's ever. And from that very moment Fibber Live for the angel and was seen standing outside a beautiful mansion house in heaven, where he lived happily ever after. The end.